The sovereign God that sits in the heavens has already scripted it, scripted the play to the final drama, and it's going to be when that temple sits down in the city of Jerusalem and Jesus walks into it as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You have, uh, you know, written now on the end times prophetic subject matter now consistently for a number of years lately. Is that yes, true? That's true. Okay. So wind the clock back. When did the prophetic thing hit you and why, you know, where were you when you, sw- I mean, did you ever just preach? I've a- always been preaching on the Yeah. Prophetic? I mean, did you ever preach anything on just something normal, like, you know, <laughs> love or something like that? I mean, it's not uh, normal. <laughs> Yes, a, a prophecy didn't start until prophetic things started happening. Okay. Uh, when when I became a pastor in 1966, uh, the first thing that happened to me was that uh, the man walked in the church with a loaded gun and tried to shoot me uh, in front of my congregation, in his words, to prove that there was more power, more demon power, uh, and then there was the power of Christ to save me. And, um, you know, and the theology that I had been raised in, uh, demons were not in America. They were in foreign countries. And that was a very convenient theology. Right. Uh, until you're looking at one and he's got a gun and uh, he's saying he's going to shoot you. He said, I want to shoot you. I've got a gun. I said, I have the word of God. It says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And he shot six times and missed. I then wrote a book, Invasion of Demons. I never saw myself as a writer, but it was an experiential book. And I typed it on a cheap typewriter, sent it off to Revell, and it became a bestseller. And uh, from there on, I wrote about things that I knew about because that's the essence of writing. And then whenever the Cold War with Ronald Reagan came along, and I began to see how that global structures had come and gone, and God had orchestrated it all, then suddenly it dawned on me, there's a grand panorama here that's happening on a stage that most of us are not seeing. And I started teaching that, and it just took off. Got it. So... Life happened. You started life happened. writing based upon what you were seeing. I, I want to circle back to something. You're you're not embellishing that story at all, are you? I mean, so a guy actually walked in and shot you, and, or and shot at you right with in front a gun. Of the pulpit. Oh, I've got it. I've got a tape yeah. recording of it. Yeah. Okay. You have eyewitnesses. You were in a church. You're not dreaming. Wednesday night. Okay. And a guy shot and missed you six times. December 1971. Okay. He did. And the the bullet holes were right. There's a police report about this and the whole night? Front page of the newspaper. Okay. Sermon on demons interrupted with gunfire. Amazing. <clears throat> that was back in 71. Yeah, it was. 1971? 1971. Wow. So. Wait, 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 wait. <clears throat> I asked you before we went on the air, your first time on TBN, would you have testified about that, you know, way back in the. You know, the... You know I didn't testify about it for a long time. And then uh, sitting on the set, uh, it must have been in the early 80s, I was talking to your dad, and they were talking about various trials that they had gone through. And he said, has anything ever happened to you when you were starting in your pastorate that was particularly stressful? I said, yeah, a guy tried to shoot me. How's that? And uh, he said, Just like you said, are you kidding me? Wow. I said, no, I'm not kidding you. This is exactly what happened. And um, the man uh, ran out of the church, ran, tried to run out of the church, and a young man in my church that uh, was playing university football ran across the back of the church and hit him in the side of the head with a forearm shiver driving him into the wall. Hit, he hit that wall so hard that when the gun hit the wall, the walnut handles came off the gun. I mean, he leveled him. Wow. And it didn't daze him. My goodness. He was committed to the insane asylum just a few days uh, later. 
And 90 days later, uh, three psychiatrists said that he was ready to take his place in society, and he drove to San Antonio, went to his home, climbed a tree, and hung himself. My God. Wow. So when you, you told that same story maybe in the 80s to my dad, and he had a similar reaction, are you kidding? No, yeah, he said, uh, I said, yeah, I have a tape recording of it. Wow. And I, I let him hear the tape recording of it. And he was, it, every time I was on TBN for the next five years, said, tell me the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, my, my reaction was very similar. I think my, my dad said that he operated oftentimes in the gift of suspicion. Yeah. And uh, so maybe I inherited some of that. Yeah, I to, guarantee yeah. you. Okay, let's get kind of right into uh, where you want to start with, you know, kind of the meat of this interview. We we talked earlier and before we started, um, you know, taping today, um, that you wanted to start kind of in Jerusalem. Yes. And um, uh, well, a few months ago, we were all in Jerusalem together at the opening of the embassy. Yes. And I know that was a huge deal. And I have to say, you did a mighty fine job. Hey. I love that you ended it off. It was amazing. Fantastic. Amazing. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all its inhabitants. Let the name of the Lord be glorified today for the defender of Israel today, tomorrow, and forever is here. Can we all shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. I know that that marked a time in history. Um, can you can you share? The panorama of Jerusalem in the Bible is something that Christians really do not put together. But Jerusalem is the city of God. That's the Bible. God says, I have placed my name in the city of Jerusalem. No other nation, no other city in the world can claim that. The city of Jerusalem is where Abraham put uh, his son on the altar to sacrifice to the God he could not see to demonstrate his, his love and devotion for God. Jerusalem is the place where David defeated the Jebusites and took it over 3,000 years ago to be of the capital of Israel. Jerusalem is where Isaiah and Jeremiah penned principles of righteousness that became the moral foundations of Western civilization. Jerusalem is where David said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love you. Jerusalem is where Jesus Christ rode in on a donkey and presented himself as Messiah. That's the 173,000 day prophecy. Jerusalem is where he was crucified outside the walls. That is where he rose from the dead. That is where he's going to return to the Mount of Olives and put his foot on the Mount of Olives. It will split in half. He will walk through the, the Messiah's gate, the Eastern gate, and set down his throne in the holy city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the epicenter of eternity. It is the shoreline of eternity. Earth's last empire, if there is a last empire, that kind of reverse deduction means there were some former empires. Yes. Walk us through some of the empires as we start getting deeper into what you've written about in this book. But Daniel was the prince of prophets because he is the only one that God showed everything to from the beginning of where they were to where uh, we are going to be in the future. He's from here to eternity. And the reason is that Daniel uh, was a Jewish person uh, who had been captured as a teenager from Jerusalem and brought to Babylon and he was now working uh, as an administrator in the Babylonian government. And he prayed to God and he said, you promised us a land, and now we're out of that land. What is our future? And God said, this is your future. And he showed him in, in, in a revelation that's given in Daniel 2 and in Daniel 7, uh, and he begins by saying that there is the image of the head of gold, and that was the Babylonian empire. 
And he said, then there is a second empire that will come to power with the folded arms, one over the other, signifying that one is more powerful than the other. And that signification was evidence that the Medes were more powerful than the Persians. And then conquering the Medes and the Persians was Alexander the Great, the third global empire. Alexander the Great died at the age of 33 and divided his kingdom into four different sections, as evidenced in in, in, uh, Daniel uh, 7, where the uh, leopards with four heads and wings, because he gave the known world to the four generals of his army. From the uh, Grecian Empire come the Roman Empire that lasted a thousand years. The eastern and western, the legs, right and left, represented the eastern and western divisions until you come down to the feet that's part iron and part clay that have ten toes. We are in the iron and clay division. The ten toes will be when the government of ten is established by the Antichrist that will set up their kingdom, probably out of Europe, and rule the world. And that will be during the Great Tribulation. Then Daniel says there was a stone that was made without hands that came and crushed the image and and ground it to powder. It's the translation, crushes it into fine power. If you think the nations of the world are powerful, when they all really get together, God's going to swat them and absolutely obliterate them. And then he's going to establish his son, In the city of Jerusalem, there will be no longer the battle for Jerusalem, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ, the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave, is going to set up his kingdom in the city of Jerusalem, and we're going to be there forever and forever and forever, triumphant in the final game of thrones. Beautiful. Wow. Earth's last empire. John Hagee, right here, uh, is going. You're gonna. You're, we're gonna. We're gonna get into a few more things. And the weather here is a little different than it was in Texas when you left. Yes? Oh, in Texas it's 46 degrees and raining. This is paradise <laughs> right here. It is so pretty. It's absolutely. It feels beautiful out it, here. What it, a what a beautiful it's day wonderful. here. Yeah. Anyway, beautiful day in Southern California. The weather's only like this about 330 days a year, though. Yeah, it's just, you know, okay, sorry. So what we, uh, but what I want you to do just briefly, if you would, what do you want the reader of this book to get out of this? Most people do not have a comprehension of world history. They do not have a comprehension of Bible history. They know snippets of this and David and Saul and then Jeremiah and Daniel and the guy on the white horse. Uh, When you take the panorama of the Word of God and the panorama of history and the panorama of prophecy and weave it all together, it tells a story of how that God started with Adam and Eve and they failed. Noah and his generation failed. And God found a man by the name of Abraham that according to the Bible, was chosen to be the father of all who believe, which includes Christians, by the way, includes Jewish people, and the father of all who believe because he would teach his children in the way of God. That's something that America needs to get in their brain, that if we do not teach our children the way of God, we have failed. I feel like if I do not instruct my children and my grandchildren in the way of God, I have failed as a father and failed as a grandfather. I don't care how good you preach. If you don't instruct your children, you fail the next generation. So it continues generation to generation. God spends the rest of the book of Genesis explaining what happened to one family. They had lots of problems, serious problems. Some of those problems were so severe that... uh, It's almost beyond belief that God would continue his eternal love, but it continued all the way through the Bible, through 
King David through Jesus Christ, the descendant of King David, until he comes for us again and uh, we are taken in the rapture to be with the Lord. There's absolutely nothing, zero, zip, that has to happen before the trump of God sounds and we leave this world. We could be gone before this television show is over because there's nothing in the Bible to hold us here. Got it. The book offer is Earth's Last Empire, The Final Game of Throats. If you just tuned in, we are here in Dana Point, California. The uh, sunset that is happening is a real sunset. Um, when we were talking back um, a few minutes ago before we started, you wanted to separate the second coming of Christ yes. and the rapture. Yes. Okay? Yes. So, okay. so a lot of people think that's the same thing. No, it's not. Okay. So... Um, are you the only person that thinks that, or is there is this a, a pretty traditional view? Well, uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jesus, okay. and the Holy Spirit <laughs> have it this way. That's good enough is, for me. Is, are the ones that are backing up your yeah, position? Yeah, those, okay. those are backing up my position. I'm okay. with them. Uh, so anybody else is, is really pushing the ball uphill. Is that yeah, what you're saying? That's exactly okay. right. So um, the then then. then Break it down because some people might be hearing that for the first time. Okay? okay. The second coming and the rapture, two different things. Yes. Explain, please, sir. The rapture of the church is when Jesus comes for his church. The second coming is when Jesus comes with his church. Got it. The rapture of the church happens when he appears in the clouds of heaven. He does not come to earth. We go up to meet him. The, the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be instantly caught up to be with the Lord in the air, and we go to heaven. The first thing that happens is the judgment seat of Christ. Paul said we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds that have been done in our body, whether they are good or whether they are bad. Our works are going to be tried by fire so that our lives in its essence will be given purity as we enter our eternal life. Every person is going to stand here. People say, well, uh, you, you're already in heaven. It's not a matter of if you're going to be in heaven or not. It's a matter that you are going to give an account to God for what you have done and what you failed to do. The, the gap that exists between what you could have been and not were not because you did not use the opportunities God blessed you. You are still going to be in heaven, but you are going to receive a reward in heaven based on what you did on this earth, where there are going to be five different crowns that you can receive. You'll receive a white robe, and we are going to receive the mansions. We are going to be there for a period of seven years, and there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. While we are in heaven seven years, there will appear on this earth the Antichrist, and he's going to set up a government of ten, ten men who will lead groups of nations that will be complete dictators on the face of the earth. Every commercial exchange will be recorded. You cannot do anything without his permission. He will start out making a treaty with the state of Israel. That's for seven years. He will break that treaty in three and a half years. In this seven-year period, there will be six seals, six, uh, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. 21 supernatural acts of judgment that are coming on this earth. Just one of those acts will be whenever angels are released to destroy a third of the earth's population in a day. What's going to happen on this earth will be hell on earth. Wow. And we, the bride of Christ, are going to be in heaven. People teaching that we are going to go through that just simply or biblically misinformed. We are members of the bride of Christ. Jesus is the blessed hope. 
And there's nothing hopeful about living through seven years of hell to prove that you love Jesus. The Lord is going to take us to heaven. We're going to miss this chaos, and that's going to happen on the earth. And then Jesus Christ is going to return at the end of seven years. Those seven years will be seven times 360 because that's a prophetic year. If you can tell me the day the Antichrist will sign that treaty, I can tell you to the day that Jesus Christ will come back. We are going to come back. All of the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, all the angels of God, and we are going to, there will be a destruction at the Battle of Armageddon of those who have come against the city of Jerusalem. Then there will be a 75-day gap. Now, I know every preacher listening to this is sliding to the edge of his couch saying, where in the name of God is he getting this? This is in the book of Daniel, and it takes me several pages to mathematically and scriptorially validate it, but I assure you it's as true as John 3.16. There'll be a uh, 75-day gap wherever when Jesus comes back, There will be the judgment of the nations. That's Matthew 25. Some call it the sheep and goat judgment. But the essence of that judgment is, how did you treat the Jewish people? How did you treat the nation of Israel? Jesus said, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't bring water to me. When I was in prison, you didn't come see me. He's describing many things that happened in the Holocaust. And they said, when did we see you that? And he said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. My brethren were the Jewish people, certainly were not Gentiles. At this point in time, before the cross, we were nothing. Paul said we were outside the covenants of Israel, without God, without hope of all men most miserable. Until the cross of Jesus Christ, we were not adopted We were pagans outside the sovereignty of God. I have heard theologians say Abraham was a Christian before his time, and you just want to pull his hair out. It's just absolutely not true. And whenever uh, that judgment is over, I believe that there will be a, a period of time where your divine assignment is going to be given. God said, if you suffer with me, you're going to reign with me. And this is the only place in the prophetic flow where this fits because God is going to place righteous leadership over every nation, over every state, over every city. When that, whenever, the, whenever the eternal kingdom is established, every place on this planet is going to be sovereignly led by Jesus Christ, the word of God, and righteous people. And then he's going to set up his kingdom. The, the new Jerusalem from God is going to settle down over the city of Jerusalem. And it's going to be 1,500 miles square. Many people say, oh, how can, how can if Jerusalem is the capital of the earth and they feature what it's going to be today? No, it's going to be 1,500 miles square and 1,500 miles high. I know that's a mind stretcher, but take it up with the prophets. They're the one that said that. And then uh, Jesus is going to rule the earth. Uh, it is a... It is a theological dynasty, and I know that uh, the people who are not Christians and the people who are liberal left, just the hair on the back of their head stands up when you say that, but there's going to come a day, and it's not going to be too far away, whenever the world will be ruled by the Word of God, by men of God, and this place is going to be heaven on earth from time immemorial. Wow, beautiful. That deserves something. That was the longest answer I've ever actually had to a question. Do you remember what the question actually was? You do? Okay, because it was about... What's the the difference between the rapture and the second coming? You know, I, I, I tend to believe you because as you started answering that question, the sun was just in the perfect spot and you had this kind of golden halo around your head. But it's gone now, so I'm not sure exactly what that means for the rest of the program. But 
uh, while you were answering that, you look like an angel sitting there. So, okay. Um, you have beautiful hair, by the way. You know, you always have. You you kind of remind me, your, your hair kind of reminds me of my daddy's hair. He's in heaven. Uh, glad we're still talking about the Earth's Last Empire on TBN. We're doing the same thing that we used to do. We're still doing it. Amen? Amen. Come on now. Preaching the Word of God day one until this day. Beautiful. Okay. Um, we, we, I think, you know, what we need is, I need you to answer this. Why and what do you want us to take away from that version of the, uh, uh, the, your, the, the answer that you just gave? Are you preaching hope in a biblical, prophetic sense? I mean, what, what Absolutely. are you saying? Okay. Absolutely. The thing that I'm presenting is the chaos that we're presently going through. And if you watch some of the Kavanaugh uh, pro, uh, confirmation, that's chaos. That's absolute governmental chaos. And that is the spirit of Washington, D.C. That's the spirit of what's happening in Europe. Europe is disintegrating. The European e economy and the European governments are, are coming apart. They are looking for another Caesar. And as all of this is e developing, we, the bride of Christ, know because of the word of God, Daniel teaching, Ezekiel teaching, all the other prophets teaching, we are getting ready to leave this world in the twinkling of an eye. All you have to do is give your heart and life to Jesus Come Christ, and you're going. People have made getting to know Jesus too complicated. Churches have pamphlets that you have to read to be saved, for heaven's sake. Uh, the first thief, that the first person who went into heaven under the auspices of the blood of Christ was a career criminal. And all he said on the cross was, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, that's enough. You're going with me today into my father's kingdom. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching this program and you really want to have a life that is eternally exciting, all you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want to receive you as Savior and Lord of my life and mean it to the core of your being. And the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon you and your life will never be the same, I assure you. So like you would have said back in the late 70s or 80s when you were first appearing on TBN, call that number on your screen. Tell us about uh, what that you've prayed a prayer. You realize that that telephone number is still on that screen 45 years later. We're still doing the same thing. You're still sitting here. You're still upright. You still got your hair on your head. And you're doing you're doing the same thing that you've been doing for all those years. Your dad would look the Tamar in the eye and say, souls, Come on now. souls, souls. We had a number on the board on the wall. How many people were saved that night had been saved that year? That is the. That's heaven's goal. Yeah. The, the he that one of souls is wise. The only time God ever gets close to complimenting humanity is in that in that regard. He that one of souls is wise. Something every church in America needs to recognize. If you're not evangelistic and winning the lost, you're wasting your time as wow. far as God's concerned. Wow, beautiful. Okay, um, the... The book is Earth's Last Empire. The 800 number is on your screen, and we want you to get this book. The, the operators are, are ready. First of all, it's a beautiful afternoon. This, uh, you know, is just kind of heavenly out here, and the the sunlight, and, you know, you have this bit of an angelic glow on. on do I have it too, or is it just, is it just you? I'm going to lean up like this and, and get a little bit of that heavenly glow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh we have one final question but i kind of i kind of want to do that same thing again because what we touched on a second ago is what you're really doing is you're telling our generation that god's got this mess in the palm of his hand is that is that kind of what you're telling us? that's absolutely what okay. i'm saying okay in spite of the chaos the confusion 
the global disturbances that are and are will be coming. Just hear that old gospel song. He's got the whole world in his hands because he most assuredly does. And nothing is out of control as far as heaven is concerned. Just keep your eye on Jesus and everything's going to be all right. Does anything else have to happen biblically before the second coming? You're talking before about the rapture. The, you, Sorry. You, yeah. Yeah. No. Before the rapture, no. Absolutely not. Okay. We're ready to go. Okay. We're okay. ready to go. The Bible the Bible gives several major signals of the being ready for the rapture. The most important one is the rebirth of the state of Israel that happened in 1948. The second one would be that Jerusalem was reunited to the state. That happened in 1967. Now, uh, God teaches in the book of Judges that he measures time in modules of 50 years. Israel is God's prophetic clock. When Israel is out of the land, the clock stops ticking. When the Jews come back to the land, the clock starts ticking. The Jewish people were out of the land for almost 2,000 years. And now in, 19, in 1917, with the Balfour Declaration, they came back into the land of Israel. The clock started ticking. 50 years from 1917 and 60 and 50 would be 1967 when Jerusalem was reconnected to the state of Israel. 50 years to 1967 is 2017 when the president of the United States in one, one year's time announced Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And dedicated the embassy by moving it from Jerusalem to the state of Israel. I am also directing the State Department to begin preparation to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This was an enormous thing because it fulfilled the statement in the book of Deuteronomy where God said to Israel, I will among the nations make you the head and not the tail. You will be the decision maker. You will not be manipulated by the nations of the world. God is getting ready to defend Israel in such a supernatural way. It's gonna take the breath out of the lungs of the dictators on planet Earth. But we are living on the cusp of the greatest, most supernatural series of events the world has ever seen. Ready or not, it's getting ready to happen. What do you what do you say to somebody that, that has tuned into this broadcast and just either doesn't understand it? How, how do you break this subject down to the simplest detail? If you're looking for hope, one of the best things you can do initially is shut off the television watching the endless sewage that flows through your living room on that screen. And I'm talking about secular television with all of its doom and gloom. If you will begin to read the Word of God, it is the most hopeful manuscript in all of the world. The Bible calls God the God of all hope. He is the God who has promised from the first day in the book of Genesis that he will be our provider, our physician, our healer. He will, be, he will lead us uh, in paths of righteousness. Whatever it is that we need, he will provide it. All you have to do is just sit down and ask him. I, I, I sit on my back porch in a chair and just talk to God like he's sitting right there. My wife often walks out on the back porch and says, who are you talking to? I said, God, he's right here, and we're having a chat. And to me, God is just that close. Prayer is a conversation with God. You don't have to pray in the King James terminology. God doesn't speak King James. Jesus is in heaven talking in Hebrew, and he understands the English language. Just talk to him like a friend. Tell him how you really feel. 
And I know that some of you watching this telecast in your life have been horribly abused. You were abused as a child. Your father abused you. Your mother abused you. They abandoned you. There were things that happened in your life that are enough to make you an emotional cripple for the rest of your life. And I know how, what heavy percentage that happens to be. But I'm telling you, there is a hope that is steadfast and sure. There is a father who loves you, and he's Father God. And all you have to do is just one time say, Father, please come into my life and show me the way. Let hope be born in my soul. Let me sing a new song. Let me feel the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Come into my heart today as the Lord of my life. I guarantee you, as sure as the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, God himself will invade your life, and everything in your life that's gone wrong will suddenly turn right, and the goodness and the mercy and the provision of God will become a reality. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. You know what, what kind of happens? You know, what... It, this is a, this is an entry that no matter what subject you start talking about the things of God through, no matter what door you open up, the earth's last empire is what we've been discussing. But what it boils down to is God loves you. Yes. He wants you to be uh, with Him. He wants you to 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 enjoy this life yes. and 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 experience who and what He is. And it doesn't matter where you start. What you finish with is the very simple thing that God is love, that he sent his son, and that, and that you know, uh, look, uh, that's what Christian TV does. You've been doing Christian TV longer than we have. You've been doing Christian TV as long as Christian TV's been in existence. What's the importance of Christian TV? I think the importance of Christian TV is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into the homes and the hearts of the American people. I think that a lot of things that are being preached over some networks uh, have no more to do with Jesus than this glass of water. Mm. Uh, they, there is a kind of casual Christianity that has become an undisciplined kind of life and living uh, that uh, is simply not scriptural. God will forgive you of your sins, but he will not continue to bless you in your perpetual and your perpetual continuation of sin. People think, well, I've been teaching this for eternal grace. Here is a statement about the doctrine of grace that will help clarify a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of misteaching. And that is that to grant forgiveness, to use the grace of God to grant forgiveness without demanding a change in conduct is to make the grace of God an accomplice to evil. I want to say that again. To take the grace of God and allow it to be used to grant forgiveness without demanding change is to make the grace of God an accomplice to evil. This is Jesus with a woman who was brought, caught, brought to him in adultery. And obviously the Pharisees wanted to, wanted to stone her because she was guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. And Jesus said, neither do I forgive you. I forgive you, but go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That is an issue that the church needs to address God will not bless you in your continuous sin. I don't care what you have done that's sinful. He will forgive you, but you don't go out the next week and continue doing it and have the grace of God to cover you perpetually. You, get, you are forgiven of your sin to stop sinning and to become a righteous follower of Jesus Christ. And the church is easing into a dimension where there is no discipline in the biblical essence of what Jesus was all about. There is a righteous life to be lived once you're following Christ. I'm not talking about self-righteous and holier than thou. I mean righteous to the place that you do your best 
to do what the Word of God says. It does not mean that you will do well every day. I mean, there are some days I drive home and I say, God, if I was you, I would fire me. I would <laughs> fire me right now because there are some days it just doesn't Explain go well. more about that for us. I get it. Yeah. There are days, you know, we, we have 22,000 church members and over 700 employees, and Christians United for Israel has 4.5 million people. We have leadership all over America and literally all over the world. We've got a lot going on there. And there are some days your phone rings off the wall and there are more problems coming through the door than you can shovel out of the way. And about 5, 30, or 6 o'clock at night, brother, you're slamming the phone down and heading out the door. And, and you're, <laughs> you realize I asked you about the importance of Christian TV and you got down a rant and all of a sudden you've been fired. So um, I'm telling I, God to fire uh, me. Uh, <laughs> so... The importance of Christian TV to get that message out. So you've done that. Get the message of hope to America. That whatever you've done, God will save you. And God is anxious to forgive you. But you must ask for forgiveness and then walk in the purity that God gives you. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. You, You are mortal flesh. It means that you are going to, to the best of your ability, every day honor the Lord. And uh, that's why we have uh, church every seven days, so we can retune our soul to the touch of heaven. Beautiful. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.